somewhere in between decades and years. And uh, Tammy Duckworth, Dick Durbin, Tom Udo have all worked really dedicatedly on this. I'm going to speak, say a few words, then I'm going to have to go. And uh, Dick or Tim will take over, I guess. Okay. So, look, what the Senate did today behind the leadership of the colleagues who are behind me is what we should be doing every day, working on a bipartisan basis to make a real impact for our country. It's a rare day here in the Senate. I wish we didn't have to say that, but it is. But the Senate just sent a, sh a clear shot across the bow. A bipartisan ma majority of senators don't want the President waging war without congressional approval. That sums up the whole thing. The President does not have the authority to go to war. Democratic and Republican senators have made that crystal clear. No President, no President can sidestep Congress when it comes to matters of war and peace. That's what the Founding Fathers embedded in our Constitution. It's one of the most bedrock principles in America. And we have to uphold it, and that's why we're here today. The President, Trump or any other President, cannot plunge the United States into an endless conflict in the Middle East. Today, our Constitution worked exactly as the framers wanted it to work. Senators worked together to assert Congress's authority and serve on the check of an overreaching executive branch. All 47 Democrats, eight Republicans, stood up and said enough is enough. Enough with endless wars. Enough with an executive having too much leeway over the matters of war and peace. Enough unilateral escalation of hostilities. We stood strong for the principle that our country should not go to war without a vote of Congress. Now, we wish there were more Republicans supporting us, but I think President Trump certainly received this message. In the future, more Republicans will join us. We're sure of that. The American people don't want endless wars. And it will, we will show, we have shown today, the power of Congress when we have members willing to make decisions based on what the Constitution and our constituents want not what President Trump wants. We're supposed to use this power to prevent one branch from becoming too powerful and abusing our Constitution. So I hope, I pray, that this is not the last time that we will come together and make decisions on what our constituents want, not what the presidents want. I hope this is not the last time we will come together and this Senate will put country ahead of party. Senator Kaine's War Powers Resolution is a huge step in the right direction. It will correct decades of decay in congressional power. I want to commend Senator Kaine, Senator Duckworth, Senator Durbin, Senator Udall, and so many others. This has been a le long labor. This did not just happen like that. And uh, maybe miracles happen. The President will come to his senses and not veto this because he knows it's the right thing to do. With that, let me turn it over to Senator Kane. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks to everybody. And I'm going to be quick because I think others want to speak and some have to go. I'll stay to take questions. I, I really appreciate the support of my colleagues in this. They know that I have been kind of a pest about this since I got here. I, 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 I said the word pest to uh, Senator Menendez, my ranking on foreign relations, and he said, we got a different word for it in Jersey than pest. <laughs> it's been an obsession of mine just because I, I just feel so deeply that the sacrifice that our troops make and that their families make and that their friends make is just so massive that we owe them the most careful deliberation that we will bring to any topic in our lives to the question of whether or not there should be war. And that's sadly not what Congress has been doing. Congress is of either parties for years under presidents of either parties. And this is a step back in the right direction. And I want to thank my colleagues here on the Democratic side. When the strike happened uh, that killed General Soleimani, Dick and I were on the phone the next morning saying the Senate was only going to be open that day for one hour. And we were on the phone the next morning and said, we need to file this resolution. And we got it filed within that hour, Senator Durbin and I. Others joined on. And I want to acknowledge the Republicans who helped, too, because when we hand-sold it to them, you know, some have a different view of executive, legislative, you know, war-making than we do. But some were intrigued and said, we'd like it better if you change this or change that. And they gave us good suggestions. The version that we called up today was not the original version. It was a version that we worked out with many of the Republicans who ended up voting with it, the eight Republicans who voted. And they gave us good suggestions to make it better, make it bipartisan. That's an important thing, too. Matters of war and peace should not be the providence of one party or the other. We, when we speak, 
in a bipartisan way on a matter of war and peace. We send a message to the troops that is a, a message of unity, and that's what the troops and the fam their families deserve. So uh, I really love working with my colleagues on this and Senator Durbin. Thanks, uh, Tim, and make no mistake, we wouldn't be standing here today if it weren't for the efforts of uh, Senator Kane. He showed a mastery of the subject, uh, legislative skill, enormous patience, <coughs> and incredible uh, effort on his part to work through a series of amendments, uh, some of which were literally destructive amendments which would have ended our effort uh, had we not prevailed. So th thank you, Tim, time and again, you and your team and uh, all of those of us who support you. Uh, we're happy to be in that position. So last year in the United States Senate, you pr probably heard me say before, we considered 22 amendments in the entire year, 22 amendments in one year. We did six amendments today. So first things first, the Senate has got the lights on, open for business, taking up legislation, actually almost debating a few times. I mean, it's really re refreshing and heartening. And after what we've been through in the beginning of this year, I hope it supports into things to come that we're gonna to try to work together on a bipartisan basis to solve some problems. But this one was the right one to start the debate because it got to the very heart of our constitutional responsibility, the only branch of government with the power to declare war. I can remember, I was in high school and college at the time, the Vietnam War divided this country bitterly. And at the end of it, Congress stepped up and said, I hope we've learned a lesson. From this point forward, Congress needs to be in on the decision making of going to war and the War Powers Act was introduced and passed over the veto of President Richard Nixon. Jake Javits, a Republican senator from New York, said this of that effort to create the War Powers Act. He said, Congress has got to get up on its hind legs and fight for its right to join in the awesome decisions of war. That, I think, really puts a finger on it. It is an authority and a responsibility under the Constitution. It is awesome because it is literally a matter of life and death when you vote on a declaration of war. No one knows that better than my colleague, Senator Duckworth, who will speak to you momentarily. But today we took a step forward to validate our role under the Constitution. I hope, I sincerely hope, that the President will not veto this, but if he does, I hope it will rally even more Republicans on their side to join us and override the veto. This really gets to the heart of why we ran for the United States Senate and took an oath to uphold the Constitution. Next up, the junior senator from Illinois, Tammy Duckworth. <coughs> Well, I thank my senior senator, Senator Durbin. Um, you know, this is something I've been working on since I was in the House of Representatives. And in fact, when I was in the House, I stood up against President Obama's attempt to expand the AUMF to allow him um, uh, additional actions uh, uh, back then, even looking at Syria. Um, and so when I got over here to the uh, Senate, um, it was one of the first conversations I had about the need to sunset the previous AUMFs and have a real argument and debate over what the new authorization should be. Um, you know, I think it's very clear uh, the Constitution does not give the President the power to declare war. Only Congress has that authority. Um, and it's regardless of who is in the White House. Congress must do its job. You know, when I was recovering at Walter Reed, there were protesters outside the hospital gates, especially on Friday when the fresh load of war wounded were flown in from theater, from both Afghanistan and Iraq, and were flown in. And they were right outside the gates, and those buses with the war wounded would have to go through those protesters. And, um, you know, I was proud that they were there because they were ex exercising their right to free speech, and I had fought for their right for free speech. But when you our troops are downrange and their families are here praying for their loved ones' safety. They need to know that they have the backing of the country and at the very least the backing of the full Congress of the United States um, so that they can go down and do their jobs and not have to worry about whether or not what they're doing is uh, uh, in keeping with what our government wants. Um, and so this is why it's so important to um, have this full debate on the AUMF um, and to clarify the um, Congress's role Look, it's been five weeks since President Trump stomped on the Constitution, circumvented Congress, and launched a strike that killed General Soleimani. Now, while I am glad the man is dead, I am glad he has gone to meet his maker, I will tell you that that decision put everyday Americans at greater risk because he did not have a good plan for how to react to the aftermath of the war. We have now more troops deployed to a region 
uh, into the Middle East. And in fact, we have 15,000 more troops in the Middle East today than there were when President Trump took office. So for a man who said that he was going to lower the number of troops uh, in the Middle East, under his watch, we now have 15,000 more. I think that we need to have a discussion on the AUMF to avoid the expansion, the creep, the mission creep that happens. Um, you know, when I pointed out that Secretary Mark Esper told me under oath that the AUMF that exists now, the 18 years old AUMF, would not authorize war with Iran, the administration pivoted to other excuses as to why they were conducting the strike against Soleimani. Their rationale has been as fluid as water. You know what? I care. I care that we do this. I care that we do this because I care about our troops. And if you truly care about our troops and their military family and America's role in the world, then you would be in a position to support sunsetting the AUMF, talking about having real discussions here in Congress. And I'm so proud of the Republicans who joined us and cast their, um, their affirmative votes today. <coughs> and um, as, as uh, Chuck said, Let's hope the president doesn't veto this um, so that we can really get on with the bipartisan work that still lies in front of us to make sure that we live up to the sacrifices of our troops. Thank you. And I'll be followed by Senator Udall. Thank you, Tammy, for that very moving statement. And, and there was one thing she said that, that I think is particularly moving, Tim. Um, is, is military families want to know uh, when their children are out there on the line that uh, the U.S. government is fully behind them. And, and we can talk uh, about the Constitution, but uh, that is a very, very important part of it. And I know Tim and his wife, Ann, he's got a son that's in the military. That makes a difference, and Tammy knows that very well from her so service. So today... Uh, this is, and thank you, Tim. It's been great to be a part of your team, and I think this is a wonderful, wonderful bipartisan uh, victory. Today is a good day for the Senate. We stood up for the Constitution and for the balance of powers in a bipartisan way. Um, that's a big deal, and it's pretty rare around here when it comes to some of these big constitutional issues. Some people may be asking, why now, when the situation has diffused somewhat? The answer is this. Under this president and, the, and his administration, we know we will be on the brink of war again. We're doubling down, they're doubling down on the failed maximum pressure campaign. And this president is newly emboldened. He thinks he can do anything he wants under Article 2, and he keeps saying that and repeating it over and over again. So it is absolutely necessary to act now before it's too late, and I'm glad we did. The message we sent today is unequivocal, and make no mistake, this message is critical at this moment in time. We're not telling the president, we, we're telling the president Congress has not signed off on a war with Iran, and the American people do not support it. Our troops and their families deserve a Congress that takes the hard votes to determine whether we put them in harm's way. We can't stop here, though. Congress has so much more work to do to reassert our authority and to take back the power we've ceded to the executive branch. Thank you, Tim. Absolutely. Are there questions here, please? So Churchill has this great statement, you know, this is not the end, it's not the beginning of the end, it's the end of the beginning. I think this is the beginning of the beginning. Congress has abdicated this resp responsibility for so long, for so long that this vote shows Congress and the Senate getting back into it. But it's only a start because we have to grapple with this question of Iran. We have a, I have a bill with Senator Young to, that many have many co-sponsors bipartisan to repeal the 91 and 2002 AUMFs. There's a need to rewrite the 2001 AUMF in the way that Senator Duckworth was describing. And we probably need to, to go back into the War Powers Act of the 1970s and update it to the current realities of war, non-state, cyber attacks, drones. 
So there's a whole series of these issues that are big and important and challenging, but Congress has wanted to hide under the desk rather than dealing with them. Today's step is a very good step to have a bipartisan, strong majority in the Senate saying we're taking this seriously but again. Question, follow up to what you said at the beginning. Is my understanding that this gentleman in Saudi Arabia won this past congressional race against yep. Sanders and Senator Reid, and they thought that was the beginning of the game. Right. So, really um, even to the, to the last well, I mean, same type of issue. Sure. I, th that would be a great example. This th Only twice in our history have we used this privilege motion, and we passed that last year to back the United States out of the horrible misprosecution of the civil war in Yemen by the Saudis. President Trump vetoed it. We couldn't override it, but President Trump then changed the behavior. We were attacking, we were asserting the U.S. shouldn't be engaged in fueling Saudi jets on the way to bombing runs. President Trump vetoed the resolution, but then he stopped the U.S. from doing what we wanted him to stop. So this is a process of Congress reasserting its rightful role and having that dialogue with the President. We do not hurt ourselves by fully honoring our responsibility. The President's going to do what he's going to do, but we do think putting this bill on his desk with strong majorities in both houses will, in, at a minimum, will influence his thinking about whether another war is a good idea or not. Please. So I just had a similar question, not identical. Do you measure yes. the uh, No, no. This, this one is a joint resolution, so this will go to the House, and our – the House understood we didn't take up theirs. theirs. Theirs was a good, you know, bill for the House purposes. Didn't necessarily meet the privilege requirements on the Senate side that would enable a simple majority vote. So they understood we would take up our version, and we've had very positive discussions and think it's likely after the recess that the House would take up our version and send it to the White House. Please. I'm, yeah, I'm very glad to talk, and, and Senator Duckworth may want to weigh in on this one, too. I don't think that President – I mean, bluntly, I don't think that President Trump is like, well, the Senate doesn't like this, so I guess I better do something else. That's not the way he thinks, but here it is the way he thinks. He cares deeply about what the American public think about this. So when a bill goes on his desk that has strong majorities in both houses, he knows this. Well, we've been talking to our constituents, we've been listening to them, and we know what they think about another – war in the Middle East right now, especially a war that might be unnecessary, especially a war that probably would have been avoided had we not torched a diplomatic deal, especially a war that's kind of blundered into. I know what Virginians think about this. Tammy knows what folks from Illinois are saying about this. And when we put that bill on the President's desk, he's going to know what Americans think about this. The President does have, I believe, a sincere – it is not It is not necessarily always consistent, but it is a sincere – we should probably be in fewer wars. We should probably be pulling away from some of these wars. He says that over and over, over again. He says in the State of the Union. So when this bill goes on his desk, I'm sure he could care less what Tim Kaine thinks or that what 55 votes in the Senate means. But the bill getting to his desk is an indication that we're listening to our constituents and we're telling him blundering into another war right now would be a bad idea. He's got an election that he's focused on, that he wants to win. He's looking at polls. He's looking at what the American public thinks about critical issues, and there's nothing more critical than war. So I think this is the kind of thing, much as the Yemen resolution did, when it gets on his desk, he could care less about us in some ways. But he does care what the American public thinks, and a bill like this shows what the American public thinks. Um, if he vetoes it, we can't override it. But he could well veto it and then adjust behavior. It will influence his decision-making just like it did in the Yemen situation. I don't know if Senator Duckworth wants to respond to this. Yes, please. I think we have to remember, too, that he's also dealing with the consequences of his action in Iran with killing um, General Soleimani um, and with the, uh, uh, the number of cases of brain injuries that have now come to the, come to the forefront. The fact that as a result of um, him launching that attack, we've now sent an entire brigade uh, uh, unannounced, uh, unprepared, you know, just they, they just got sent without um, a lot of preparation into the Middle East. Now we have 15,000 more troops in the Middle East than we did before he took office. All of those things I think he will take into consideration. And so as he thinks about what he's going to do next, he's going to be looking back um, on the fact that, hey, by the way, um, you know, I, I called um, brain injuries, uh, headaches, and now there are 50 troops who are being taken who are, who are dealing with it. And it's a lifelong injury that our wounded are going to have to deal with. Um, he's dealing with the blowback from that. Um, uh, 
He's looking now at 15,000 more troops, the entire brigade that he just sent over. And so if this is something that he can, ha that, that gives him a little something where he hangs his hat on or his thinking on, it's like, well, maybe I'm not going to do this because now we've got a bipartisan group of senators who push this forward and makes him think twice about um, launching, uh, you know, uh, 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 this type of attack again, then that's great. Then let's do that. So let's hope that we change his behavior. But we're not going to stop doing our job. We're, we're the United States Senate. We have to do our job, and we in Congress have to do our jobs. You know, I mean, when I talked about those protests earlier of the people protesting uh, outside Walter Reed, that was with a war that the Congress had, had voted to support. Our troops look back and they see that. Our troops need to see that we are united behind them when we send them off to war. Not that we're fighting about whether or not they should even be there, and they're downrange. So, so this is also a message to, yes, to the president, but this is also a message to our troops, to our military men and women, that we are going to do our job just as we expect them to do their jobs time after time after time. How about one last one? And yeah. I'll take one more, please. Um, so the <coughs> entire time that the position of Georgia has been taken up has been very good um, and it's gone up pretty much every other election. Um, so, you know, sitting in Cuba is a very pretty view. I do think Congress needs to take that on board and say, you know, what can we do to make sure that Cuba is a safe place for women? That would be, that's down the road. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, courts have traditionally, with probably one exception, have Courts have traditionally been. Oh, I'm sorry. Courts have traditionally been really reluctant to grapple with the, the to, to referee between Congress and the executive over the war powers questions. And so the notion that well, the president's doing this and there hadn't been a vote that would be a tough court case in my prediction. There there have been a couple that have won. Liz Holtzman, mm -hmm. uh, who was in Congress, won one uh, as a lawyer before she was in Congress. But then I think it was it was maybe set aside by the Second Circuit. So this goes way back. Um, but I just think we just need to keep building on what we have gained here, which is more and more of a bipartisan consensus. Tammy, I didn't mention this to you. Yeah. A number of Republicans came up to me and said, I would vote for this. I don't want to vote for it in the middle of this most recent thing with Iran. But if it's part of an NDA amendment or something, the general principle, I'd vote for it. So actually, I think there's some more Republican votes out there. The farther we get away from 2001, the more people are uncomfortable with being on autopilot in wars that have gone on for 19 years. And so the more Republicans, I think, will start picking up. That's the best thing we can do is show just a stronger and stronger bipartisan recognition that we shouldn't be at war with Al-Qaeda. Right, and also we're also sending the message that, hey, you can't continue to, to stretch this definition so that we are, you know, con conducting uh, activities in Africa against Boko Haram and say this is tied to the 9-11 attacks, for crying out loud. Um, and we can't stop doing our jobs just because we have a president who's out there doing, you know, whatever he wants to do. I mean, I, I've said this before. My 21-month-old my, my toddler has better self-control than this president does. Um, uh, and so we can't just because, you know, well, he'll do whatever he wants. doesn't mean that we, we have to stop doing our jobs. My, my constituency voted for me to do my job. And my job is to make sure that uh, when it comes to matters of, of war and peace, that we have a real debate here. And I'm going to hold my colleagues accountable to that, and I'm going to make them have these debates as well because our troops deserve nothing less. Thank you so much, very much. Thank you. Hey, and have a good week. I'll see you back. Okay.